Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and I'm here to show you today how to use a telescope or just a camera and a lens with either a moving tripod that automatically moves or, a, or, or even just a simple basic tripod that doesn't move, it's pretty much whatever you have, to take really good photographs of the sky using stacking software. And that's the important part, stacking software. Now stacking software is software that stacks photographs together to make a bit better picture. And I'll explain more in detail because that's really simplified. Um, there are expensive uh, stacking software packages you can buy and there are free ones too. I'm going to cover a free one because most people are not going to want to spend a bunch of money, especially if they don't know what they're you know, getting into. But if you want to, there are also more expensive ones you can buy. But I'll show you a basic one. Now I have a, um, a, a lens here to start out with. I don't ever give enough love to my uh, Maxitov right here, so I'm going to show it to you guys to start with. This is a, what is it, a 1300 millimeter. It's an f12.7, which means it's pretty dark. That means the ratio to this, to this, the focal length to the aperture is not so good. It's very high magnification, not a lot of light gathering ability. So it's not so good to me here where I live, although it's great for birds, let me tell you that. Anyway, and I have a Skywatcher um, uh, mount right here. Let's twist this so you can see. This is a Skywatcher um, uh, Star Adventure. And I'm not, by the way, um, pushing this mount here, but because I am mentioning it, let me just state for FCC rules that they sent me this guy for free. So there's my FCC um, disclaimer, even though this isn't about this, it just happens to be in the photograph. But to make sure I'm completely legit in every way, what you will need for doing this is you're going to need either a telescope or a lens that has the ability to you know, zoom in a little bit. Like this guy right here, this is a basic kit lens that comes with, um, comes with your camera. This screws off the front, by the way, this part right here screws off. Um, so you need either this or you need a telescope. Any one will do, they all have various pluses and minuses, and that's, it, that's its own video, by the way, to get into. But anything like that will work. Now I know you're probably saying to yourself, well Tom, we understand that you can hook your camera up, you'll need a DSLR camera. Um, you'll need, you can hook your camera up to this lens, that's fine Tom, we understand that, but how do you hook this to this? Before I go into any more, I'll show you. By the way, this is an old camera from the 90s that's no longer used anymore. See, look, I'm like touching the mirrors and don't care about it because like you don't use it anymore. It's an old and dead, in fact, it's a film camera. It's because I use my good camera for doing the video, so obviously that you know, wouldn't work. See, look at that old film camera. I used to do photography back in the day. So you'll need this to hook to any camera that you have. You need a ring mount. That right there hooks into the camera. These cost like about 10 or 15 bucks off of Amazon. Then you'll need an adapter, it's called a T-adapter, and you need a T-adapter that fits your ring mount and then fits a 1.25 inch connector that goes in the end of the telescope. So I can put links up for these things. I'll put links for the Canon one. I don't know about the other ones. They all exist in the internet. Just type in like Nikon or whatever you have or you know Sony A3, whatever their Sony numbers are. I've been a Canon person forever though, so I only know Canon stuff. So screw that on. Hook this to here. Make sure you don't get a bunch of dirt inside of it. So like try to do it, you know, with a, a pro tip, put a blanket over top of you or something that, that, that doesn't have any fuzzies on it and do your changing of lenses underneath that. You don't want to get dirt on the um, CCD. And if you do get dirt in the CCD, pro tip number two, use something like this. This little thing, I love this thing. So you can blow on the CCD and get the dirt off of it because people don't get the dirt off their CCD and that's the chip that's inside and what you end up with is you end up with these little specks that appear all over the photograph. If you have those, that's where that's coming from. Usually most cameras when you go into them have a manual clean button that opens up the shutter unless you see what's inside and you very carefully blow that stuff off. Don't touch it with your fingers. Just blow it off with your with the little duster. What I usually do is hold the camera upside down like this and I gently from a distance blow to get the dust out and then I go more closely and very carefully using smaller, faster little um, squeezes, get all that dirt out. So very important to do. So you can hook this up to your telescope, like so, or you can hook up a camera. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you how to do both of those. Now I'm gonna show you all of this during the daytime because it's too hard to show it at night. I've seen videos where people try to show it at night and they have all these red lights and everything and they're trying to show you, but it's just easier to go take the photos that I'm gonna show you and then show you how I did it at night, uh, show, show you how I did it during the day. So here we are. And so we're going to start out with the, the telescope and the camera, then I'm going to show you how to do it with this the tripod and the camera. So first off, the tele... Oh, one last thing. 
you need to get one of these things. It doesn't have to be a newer brand. No, you have to only buy a newer brand. Only newer brand makes... No, you, you can buy whatever brand you want. So forget the infomercial for them. But um, this is a device that lets you set how long, the delay for how long you want the photos to go off, for 10 seconds till the photos start, 20 seconds, whatever you want. The um, how long you want the photos to be, the interval in between, all that kind of stuff. And you're like, but Tom, the camera does that. Yeah, but usually they only, unless you buy an expensive one, they usually only go to 30 seconds. And sometimes you want to expose for longer than that, depending on what you're doing. So trust me, these things are a lifesaver and they cost like 15 bucks. So, so far you're looking at, for a decent body, for, for a decent introductory body, you're looking at about 300 bucks for one of these things, DSLR, 15 to 20 bucks, for, uh, maybe 30 at the most for your connectors right here. Another 15 for here. And then after that, the lens probably came with it. So you would, um, Maybe you want to buy extra lenses and telescopes and tripods, but that's totally at that point up on you. You only need the camera by itself and maybe a simple tripod for the basics. So let's start off with the telescope. When working with the telescope, you'll want a tracking mount. Now a tracking mount is a mount that's capable of, oops, I'm going to loosen that up, that's capable of rotating in such a way that it follows the stars because stars apparently move. In reality, it's mostly the Earth spinning, and they, they move, but not very fast. It's mostly the Earth spinning, but since we don't realize that we're moving, it seems like they're moving. So anyway, you want to be able to point at a target, like a star, get it nice and uh, centered up, and then you want to let the telescope slowly track it across the sky. This is a German equatorial mount, for example. Um, there are many different types of mounts that are available. There's some from Iopteron, there's some from Skywatcher, there's some from Orion. Every company has one, Celestron, I think. And they range in price. Um, you're going to find that the really, the, 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 the cheapest that you can get before you start, but the cheapest you can get when you start to really be able to actually um, follow the stars and keep good heavy tracking on them without any real troubles for at least 30 to 60 seconds, it's going to start around the $400 range and it's going to go up. In fact, the mount is one of the most expensive parts of astrophotography. You can spend tens of thousands on mounts. These guys right here, this one and like the iopteron, procube, and things like that are around the three, four hundred dollar range. And they're a good way to start. And the reason I like them, and by the way, not to get advertisement-like into this thing, the reason I like them is because they have a tendency to have a use, simple user interface. You just turn this one on and now it's tracking. Turn it off and now it's not. <clears throat> they tend to have the capability of using batteries, like this one has a battery compartment, so you can just put batteries in. They um, are usually smaller and lighter than the expensive ones, so that you can move them and carry them around, which is also useful if you're just using regular cameras and you don't need anything expensive. And, oh, let me turn this around for you. A lot of times, they have the ability to plug into an auto-guider, a device that allows them to be more accurate by following the stars. You basically, it's a secondary camera that holds position on a star and feeds this thing information to keep it going. So, uh, some of these kinds of you know, units right here can be quite useful. I personally like them. Anyway, <clears throat> you can buy as you can do something as simple as taking a Celestron CG3 mount and hooking up a thirty dollar um, little motor drive to it. But the problem when you do that is is you're going to limit your exposure time to maybe 10, 20 seconds, depending on the focal length of the uh, of the telescope that you connect it to. So. Basically what it boils down to is the more money you spend, the longer you can expose. Now you say, why do you want to expose for so long? Why a minute, Tom? Why not 10 seconds? Because the longer you expose, the more light you drink, and the more light you drink, and the, the clearer the details you can pull out of the sky, for the most part. There's a lot of more variables to it than that. But <clears throat> focal length is one of the biggest problems. If the focal length, like this guy right here, this, this one has a focal length of 1300 millimeters. If you have a long focal length, then you're going to be able to expose for a shorter period of time because things in the scope are going to appear to move faster because you're looking at a smaller area of space. So if you had something like a 400 millimeter, like my Orion 400 millimeter that I'm always showing you, the 80, 80 millimeter aperture with a 400 millimeter focal length, that guy right there it can expose for 60 seconds on this mount. This one right here can only do it for about 15, 20 seconds before things apparently start to drift. And they're actually drifting the whole time, you just don't notice it until that time here, uh, occurs. Likewise, if you move into something like a camera uh, lens like this, you can go a little bit longer, all the way down to something like a wide-angle lens like this. This is an 8 millimeter, millimeter so 1,300 millimeters, 8 millimeters. <laughs> At 8 millimeters, <clears throat> a lens like this, I can expose for like 5 minutes without apparently anything moving, maybe even longer. So something interesting to keep in mind 
Anyway, so what you want to do is get your, your, your mount hooked up and set up, and that kind of depends on the company, like how it works. Most of these, well, most of these German equatorial mounts, you have to line them up to Polaris. So you want to center the mount on Polaris. And I'm not going to go into the details of this specific mount because they're all different. Um, for the alt, alt azimuth mounts, the ones that go up, that's altitude azimuth, the ones that go up and down like this and like that, uh, they, they usually don't. They usually need to be aligned to a couple of stars to be accurate, those go-to mounts. Anyway, once you're aligned and you find yourself a star that you want and you're pretty much settled on it, what I like to do is I set this thing for about 10 seconds of wait and pause period and I set the settings to where I want them to be and I sit back and I let it take a photograph. Give it a 10 seconds so that it has time to stop vibrating. Let it take a photo, take a look and see what I get. Once I'm pretty sure I have the photo that I want and it's all set up, then this unit comes into play. Now, <clears throat> I don't think I've ever used it on this one beforehand because this is long ago. I don't even know if the thing hooks up. This hooks up to my modern camera. There it goes. Look at that. It does work. Now you can set something like this up and calculate your settings. What I like to do is I like to set it for... Oops. Cut it off. I like to set it for a 10 second delay to give me time for the vibrations to clear and for me to step away. Set it for whatever the shutter speed is going to be. In this case, I have it set to 30 seconds, but you could set it to a minute or 10 seconds, whatever you want the shutter speed to be. And the interval confuses a lot of people. They're like, what the heck's the interval? The interval is how long it waits between photos, but that also includes the shutter time. So let me explain what that means. If you set the shutter exposure time, click, click, to 30 seconds, and you set the interval to 35 seconds, what that means is that it's going to click for 30 seconds and be open, click shut, and then for that remaining five seconds, it'll wait and then do it again. So what the interval is sort of like, how often do you want to start the photograph? Does that make sense? Now, one of the reasons you might do that is because sometimes people want to put things like um, uh, uh, timers and other weird functions in the camera that they that, that get set off that may take up some of that exposure, uh, some of the exposure time. So the interval is sort of like the entire period of time between photos. Exposure is a lesser time usually. So I would, I would set the, the shutter to like 30 seconds and the interval like 31 or 32. By the way, always give it an extra two or three seconds in the interval because when the shutter clicks, it vibrates the camera a little bit. That gives it some time to settle down. And then last, not, last but not least, make sure you don't, if you have a number setting, like how many photos it takes, some of them have this, make sure you set that to something like infinity or a whole bunch of numbers. That way it doesn't take like five photos and stop. I've had that happen, it's very annoying. I go check on the camera an hour later, it's only taking like three photos and I'm very angry. Set that off and take your photographs. Now, to give an idea of how you're gonna use the star stacking software, here's what you're gonna do. You're going to photograph your star and you're gonna take as many photographs as you feel comfortable taking, 10, 20, 30. I would not take less than 10 or you're just not gonna get any benefit out of it. I would take 30, 40, 50 photos if you can, 60. <coughs> Every 10 or 20 photographs, you might want to pause and look in your viewfinder and make sure that like uh, the camera has not, because remember, this is following the star. Make sure that it hasn't followed it beneath a tree that you didn't realize was there because the limbs were dark and you couldn't see them. Make sure that it's still in focus. Make sure that it's not about to run out of battery power. So check it every now and then as you're going along, right? If you have a lot of power, you might let this guy sit in here for an hour or two and photograph. Make sure the object's not drifting out, because even if it's holding still for 60 seconds in the frame or 30 seconds in the frame, over the course of an hour, it's still making its way mosley across the screen unless you have this thing really perfectly calibrated. So do that. <clears throat> now that you have your 60 fr frames, your 70 frames, whatever, the next thing you need to do is shoot some dark frames. Now I'm going to go into what dark frames are and what light frames are and what bias frames and all that stuff are in just a minute. But first, I'm just going to tell you to do it. Just trust me, and I'll explain what they are in a minute. So for dark frames, you cover the front of the telescope. You cover it with the lens cap. In fact, if you want to, you can take like a shirt or something and put it over to make it extra dark. Don't change a single setting on the camera. Do not change any setting. Just take another four, five, six dark frames. All right? I wouldn't do anything less than three, and I wouldn't do anything more than ten. So usually three to ten is a good number of dark frames to take. Once you're done taking the dark frames, the ones you took of the actual object, by the way, were called light frames. The ones you take that, that are of just the lens cap being on are called dark frames. I will explain what the difference is. Last thing to do is take your camera and set it to the fastest shutter speed it can possibly do. Leave all the other settings alone. Don't change any other setting, but set it to the fastest possible. Set that sucker up to one four thousandth of a second or whatever its fastest shutter speed is. Click the button, let it take 
four or five, six of those, the same number of them you took of dark frames is a good rule. And they're very important. You're like, but Tom, why would you do that? You've got the lens cap <coughs> still on, excuse me, lens cap is still on, and you're taking dark frames, and you're taking these, 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 these fast frames, which we'll call bias frames. And you're like, what are these bias frames for? What are these dark frames for? I'll explain in a minute. They're very useful. Now you have everything you need to take a quality photograph with the, the telescope. So before we go in and process these photos, let me show you quickly what to do with a, a non-tracking mount. All right, so I don't have a, I only have one cheap tripod, the little $30 cheap tripod. That's what my camera's on right this moment. So take this moving tripod here and just pretend that this was the cheap one from the store. Because the whole point of my next part here is to tell you to do the same thing I just did with a telescope, but with the cheaper camera or not the cheaper camera, the cheaper tripod. So I put this ball mount on the top of it so I could simulate the one you buy at the store. Because the one at the store goes up and down and right and left as opposed to all the swirly stuff, right? So put your camera on your cheap tripod and you need to probably use one of these. If you want to, if you're really trying to save money, you can use the basic timers and functions that are built in here. You can set the camera, usually to take a number of photographs, like 10 photographs, and set them for whatever timer you want. So you can do that if you want to save on the cost of this and you want to save on the cost of a tripod. Um, you can save, 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 but you're going to lose, lose, lose. Just keep that in mind. But you can do it. You can do it with as simple as a regular camera and a lens and just balance it on something if you wanted to. But I wouldn't recommend it. I would at least get a, a tripod. So anyway, this is an 8mm Rokinon um, wide-angle lens. And um, there's some other lenses you could buy. If you're really on a, trying to save a lot of money, you can buy something like this cheap guy right here. eBay sells these things for like... 30, 40, 50 bucks. They're brand new for like 110. Um, this is a 500 millimeter lens. It has all kinds of distortions. Um, this is not a high quality lens by any stretch of the imagination. And it's also heavy, so like if anybody attacks you while you're photog photographing, you can defend yourself. But this thing right here is, however, not the end of the earth. I've taken some good photographs of this. I know like if any of your photographers, you're like, oh my God, there's no way you took a good photograph with this. I have, I have, just not my best photographs. The kit lens that came with your camera, because it usually gets one like this, a 75 to 300 or something like that, will do a really good job of taking a lot of star photographs. And I've taken good photographs with this one kit lens right here. And put it down. <clears throat> and of course you can buy yourself faster lenses like this guy right here. This lens drinks in a lot of light. It's an F2. You ever see that F number that's quoted with uh, lenses? They'll be like, this is an F5 lens, it's an F8 lens. Well, that F refers to the F-stop, and it's the, the ratio, There's it's, it's not the ratio of the aperture to the focal length like it is in a, on a telescope, but there's a point somewhere inside of here, a virtual point that's kind of like where the light crosses itself, and it's the ratio of that length to the aperture length. But what it boils down to is the lower the number, <clears throat> the more aperture you're getting per focal length, so the more light you're drinking in. Does that make sense? Somebody's flying a biplane or something above me, and they've been going in circles. It's very annoying. So, the reason that that's beneficial is because the more light you can drink in, the shorter time you can be exposed for the same photograph, meaning that you get less and less motion blur. Does that make sense? All right. So, I have flight lanes over top of me, so that's why you hear nothing but just, it's like an airport right over top of my head, which is really annoying, by the way. As a pro tip, um, this will cause a lot of distortion, but if you have like only one or two lenses and you want to make a really wide angle lens, you can buy one of these little things right here. So, stuff off my deck. Basically put this guy right here. It is a 0.43 uh, 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 angle, uh, what is it, uh, um, the heck is this thing called? Basically it's a focal length extender. So what happens is you screw this onto the end of your, your lens and it takes whatever the focal length is and in this case multiplies it by 0.43. So if you had a 100 millimeter lens and you put this on, it would turn it into the equivalent of a 50 millimeter lens. If you had a, a, a thousand millimeter lens, it would turn it into the equivalent of a 500. That's important because what it's doing is it's widening up your field of view and giving you more image and drinking in more light. And the benefit to that is that you end up with a, a, a faster lens that exposes in less period of time. So 10 seconds with a normal lens might be like five seconds with this thing hooked on. But better than that, it also gives you a wider field of view, which is, could be nice too for scenes and uh, nice scenes in photography. The problem is around the edges, you'll get a lot of blurring and weird distortions because that's, this thing's cheap. So just, it's always best to have a lens that's actually the native focal length that you want. But you can do some pretty amazing stuff with something like that. So hook this guy up. And just like I showed you with the telescope, you set this up exactly the same way. You set it up for 
10, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever, and you take your photos. Now, something important to understand is the rule of 500. Some people quote that as the rule of 600, or even I've heard 300 years, but 500 is what I use. Take the number 500 and divide that by the focal length. That is how many seconds you can stay open without noticing a blur, all right? Why is that important? 500 divided by 35 versus 500 divided by 500. With this thing, I only have one second. It's 500 millimeters, so I only have one second that I can photograph before you notice a blur. With this thing, I have, um, it would be 10, it would be five seconds. It's like 50, no, 50, this thing's like 20 something seconds. This thing can be open, I think, off the top of my head. I'll correct my math in the video, of course. Um, this guy right here, this Rokinon, this thing has a eight millimeter focal length. That's like 58 seconds or something like that. So this thing can just stay open for eternity. Why is that important? Why are you just drinking the entire night sky with something like this? Something important to keep in mind because you don't have a tracking mount. So everything's moving and you're not able to take it, in, take it into account. So it's very important to keep that rule in mind. Whatever the focal length is, divide 500 by that. That's the number of seconds you can set this thing to. Now you can push beyond that. So if you're photographing a galaxy or something that's kind of big, you can try to push beyond that. And you'll, you'll, you'll make that galaxy appear, like the Andromeda galaxy or something, but the stars around it are going to be blurry. So just keep that in mind. So, set this up, take 10 pictures, 20 pictures, 30 pictures. I would recommend photographing for a shorter period of time and taking more photographs, because the star stacker is going to give you some advantages, and you don't have the advantage of a tra moving tri a tripod, so you're going to want to have to make up for that somewhere. So what I would do is I would take, if this thing can expose for let's say 10 seconds, I would set it to eight at a high um, ISO. The ISO is the expo the amount of exposure you're, uh, the amount of gain you're giving the photograph basically. So the higher the number, the more, uh, the more gain you're giving, the more uh, um, uh, uh, value you're giving to each pixel as it lights up. But the problem is that you're also adding entropy to the system. You're adding a noise and other things to the system. Now the star stacker will try to get rid of some of that noise. That's what the bias frames are for, by the way and uh, the dark frames and things. But there's still a limit to what you can do. So set that, uh, that ISO up to 3200, 16, uh, 1600, you know, 6400, somewhere in there. Set the camera to 10 seconds, eight seconds, whatever your, your, your photo speed is. Once you have the photos taken and you think that everything looks good, set this up to take 30 photos, 60 photos, 100 photos, 200 photos, whatever. I recommend, by the way, shooting in JPEG and RAW if you can do it. If you can't do it, just shoot it in RAW format. Don't just shoot in JPEG only. JPEGs are nice, they look cool, but they lose a lot of detail that you'll want to get, especially if you're using star stacking software. JPEGs that you run through star stacking software don't come out very good. So what I would say is try to shoot in RAW. That's the native format of the camera. It's the, they're, they're big files, 10, 20 megabytes, but they also are just chock full of data. Shoot in RAW. And I'll show you what to do about the problem. A lot of people say, but I don't know how to use raw files. I've got all these raw photos and I can't open them up or use them. That's okay. I'll show you how to get past that because that's a lot of problems. A lot of a pro that is a problem a lot of new people have when they start out. So take your photographs. When you're done with the photographs, just like you did with the telescope, this is just a tiny telescope, isn't it? Really? Put the cover on, shoot three, five, maybe six dark frames. There's no rhyme or reason to it at an introductory level. Just shoot a couple and then set this thing to the fastest possible shutter it can do and shoot the same number of bias frames. Again, you don't change any of the settings, just the speed. So darks are shot at the same speed, they're just exactly the same, just a lens cap. Bias are the same in every way with the lens cap except that you, you speed up the shutter speed. So now we have all of our photographs. It is time for us to go in and use the star stacking software and I'm going to show you some interesting tips and tricks of how to make your photos look really good and I'm trying to show you how to do this on a shoestring budget, meaning free stacking software, free image manipulation software. Everybody's like, we'll use Photoshop and Lightroom. You know, not everybody can afford that. Now, if you have that and you can afford that, that's great. Use it. But I'm going to show you how to use GIMP, which is free for your, uh, for your, so for your, your, your um, graphic software. And I'm going to show you how to use a converter, which is free. And I'm going to show you how to use Star Stacker, which is free. So free, 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 but not free for this. I like you guys. I'm trying to help you. But these things aren't free. Well, by this, by this time, actually, this, this guy, Rebel G from the 90s, is probably free. But you know what I'm talking about, right? So anyway, let's get on in there and let's take some, uh, uh, let's do some photo manipulation. So when you first get all of your photographs taken off of the, off of the uh, camera, if you have JPEGs, I like, to, I like to have JPEGs. I like to have um, 
uh, uh, raw photos to these. Here are the raws. These CR2s. These are Canon raw files. You'll you'll what you'll what you'll end up with is you'll end up with these big guys right here, one for each photo that you took, and they're big and they don't open very easily with a lot of software. Some stuff can read them, stuff some stuff can't. Look how big they are. So you might have trouble. You'd be like, oh, I've got all these raw files. What am I supposed to do with them? I can't open them and see them. Now, if you have something like Photoshop, you can probably open them. But if you don't, you're going to be kind of at a loss. I mean, how do I know which ones to put in the stacker? I don't remember which ones with the dark frames. What do I do? That's why if your camera has the ability to do raw and JPEG, do both. That way you end up with a JPEG reference photo. Now, these are different photos than what we actually took. These are other ones I took, other random stuff. But you get the point. You can then look through here and you say, okay, well, this is the first photo that I wanted to photograph, so you can write down this number and skippity-do through this until you find, like, the last one, and then you write it down and so on. And so you can use these as reference photos to find your way through and get listed all the stuff that you want to photograph. What was I photographing this day? Anyway, look at this. These horrible things. They came out, so these came out terrible. Anyway, although the photo came out pretty good, didn't it? Look at that. Wow. That moon photo came out pretty good. So anyway, um, once you have all these, once you've written down the numbers and you know which photos you want to use, you can now take these uh, CR number, these CR2 files here and use them. But I find that the CR2 files don't work very well in the Stacker program for some reason. You can try to use them if you want to, but I like to convert them to TIFFs. A TIFF photo looks like this. Now, if you don't want to do the JPEG or you can't do the JPEG, you can just convert all your RAWs to TIFFs because you can open a TIFF up in Windows Viewer like this and see it just fine. So you're like, but Tom, how do I how do I convert these CR2 files to TIFFs? Like, how do I do that? Well, you can download software like this guy right here, XN Convert. I like this one. It's free. It works like a champ. Notice the theme with free, by the way. Select all your photographs, whichever ones you want. Here they are, just a random selection of them. Drop them into the input. Boom. There they are. There they all appear. Go to the output. Go down and select the file type you want. Let's see here. Do, do, do. TIFF version 6. Boom. And then click the button. We're not going to do this because they're already done. I don't want to take the time. But this will convert all of them and they'll stay in the same little stupid directory right here. They'll all appear. Here's all of them right here. In fact, here's some bias frames. Bias frames. Anyway, so you'll have all the photos here and now you can take them and start sorting them out until you in, into little folders. You know, one for the bias frame, one for the darks, one for the lights, and you'll have everything you need in order to make your um, stacking. All right, so we have our photographs that we've taken. We have the lights, which are the actual real pictures of the, the, the stars and the planets or whatever it is you're photographing. This is the real stuff. So if you open it up and you look, ignore some of the stuff, um, you'll see these are the actual photos that you're, that you're going to be taking. These are the star photos right here. Here they are. So the star photographs, there's the star photographs. Okay, you have the darks. Now if you open up a dark, let's show you quickly what those are. Darks are actually dead pixels. Let me zoom in on one so you can see it. Hopefully you can see this. Let me zoom in as much as I can. See that? This is a dead pixel right here. That is a dead pixel. There's another one over here. See, here's a dead blue pixel and there's some red ones around it. These are bad pixels. And with these need to be removed from the image. And that's why, there's a nasty one right there, that's why you take photos of darks. And you take several of them, because some of them are intermittent, some of them are constant, and that way the computer can find them and sift them out. So the light frames are what you're photographing. The dark frames are showing the system what's already wrong with the camera's CCD chip. That's why they're important to have these. And last but not least are bias frames. So here's a bias frame. You won't see much of anything in a bias frame. It looks like a dark because it's photographed the same way except really high speed. The reason you did that was to cause the motor to jerk and the servos for the shutter as much as possible so that you could make any light effects that occur on the CCD chip as a result of electromagnetic interference from the shutter appear here. Now you can't see them with your eye, but if you looked at the actual data for the files, you would see that there's a little bit of data in here. And that data is basically electromagnetic interference from when the shutter like goes up and down and that kind of thing, and all the little motions of the camera. So what, you're, what you basically end up with is the following. The actual stuff you're photographing minus the the pixels that are bad and, and, and lit up that shouldn't be, minus the electromagnetic interference from the actual camera itself. Yeah, it's at that level. We actually care.
So let's open up Deep Sky Stacker. This is free software. You can buy expensive software, but it costs money. Nobody wants to spend money. So basically put, I'm going to link the the location to get this. This is version, uh, what version is this? Version 3.3.4.0. This is a good version. There are other ones you'll find in the internet that are, are, that are full of bugs and errors. So I'm going to warn you right now, if you just go out and ignore me and you just try to download your own copy, you might get the wrong one. So you might want to look at my link in the description. Here's the software. It's supposed to be intuitive. Um, I think it's not intuitive. That's me. But keep in mind, um, intuition uh, of, of, of things is sort of subjective by definition. So let me show you how to use it. It's actually really simple. I am, there's so, well, hold on. Let me explain. There's so many different settings in this. There are bazillions of settings in this thing. So what I'm going to do I thought about this long and hard, and I decided instead of going through all 8 million settings and making this like a 14 hour long video, I'm just going to show you what I do to stack. So these are default settings that I use. That doesn't mean they are the best or the only settings. The reason I'm going to do this is because you can go to their website, download their little tutorial, and read every single setting in extreme uh, nauseating detail until your head falls off, and that's on you to do. I'm not going to go through all that. I just want to show you the basic buttons that you could click that will make the software work for you and produce a picture that will look good, though it could be tweaked to be better. Does that make sense? These are going to be the kind of the better settings to use. Now you can click here to start opening up files and adding them and dropping them in. I'm going to use drag and drop because I like to drag and I like to drop. I'm lazy that way. I like object linking and embedding. That's what drag and drop means. So anyway, let's go to lights. These are the light frames. You can, like I said before, you can use the, the raw files that come out of the computer. I would suggest you uh, switching them into TIFFs. Don't use JPEGs. Oh, God, it'll turn out terrible. Don't use JPEGs. So use a TIFF. Drag and drop. Now, you're going to find that this thing's going to ask you, what are these, dude? Are these light frames, dark frames, flat frames? Dark flat frames. These are two that we're not using. These are two interesting ones, but we're not going to get into them now. We don't need them. Or bias offset frames. These are light frames. So click OK. And boom, we add the frames. There. The next thing we want to do is go to dark frames. You notice the little icon is like a globular cluster. So it's like a little picture of stars. So grab all your, your dark frames. Oops, I missed one. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm not really stacking. I've already stacked these. I'm just showing you how it works. Click the button. These are dark frames. Make sure you click dark. There they are. And we scroll down here and look, and the icon for these is little speckles of red, green, and blue, which is, if you remember, kind of what they looked like. They were black mostly with little red, green, and blue speckles. Now we'll go to bias frames. Let's grab all your bias frames. Ignore all the garbage, by the way, that's in here. Um, I've already been working in these folders. That's why. Oops, sorry. Drop them in, and these are offset bias frames. Click OK. Yay! Offset bias frames. Here they are. And they look like just kind of weird grayness, which is what all offset bias frames look like. So we're ready to, to star stack. Pro tip, click save file list and just save the file list somewhere in your computer. That way if this thing crashes, you can go right back to it easily. Now, click on stack pictures. You're like, but what about this, Tom? You don't need to do it because if you click here, when you're done doing this, it'll then um, uh, you, could, the, you then have to click this button. But if you click this button, it's going to start here and work its way down. So it's kind of weird. You can actually start at the end. Don't ask me why. I don't know. So. When you get in here, you can click on recommended settings, and this will give you all the recommended settings. Now, green settings are settings that you're already set to. Blue settings are settings that you could set yourself to. So basically, it's saying, hey, look, you could use this, or you could use this, or you could use whatever you're using. And you can look at these and read them in careful detail and see what they are. Oh, I like this this setting here instead of what I was using. Oh no, I changed my mind. Now I want to use this again. And you, this is throwing out recommended settings. It's saying, hey, look, dude, if you're doing a hydrogen alpha, like for nebulas and stuff, maybe you want to do this. If you're not, maybe you want to do something else. So that's that's what this is doing. It's, it's showing you all your recommended steps. We're not going to go through all of those, but that's what they are. So let's go into parameters. Here's the basic stuff you'll need to make this thing work. Step one. Under the results, set yourself to standard mode. You have mosaic, you have intersection. These are basically saying how it's going to take all the photos that don't match each other completely because, you know, the um, cam camera mount's moving. How are we going to stick them together? There's your Venn diagram setting, pretty much. That's pretty much trying to shove everything together into a collage. We're going to go with standard mode, pretty much the best of everything. You have all these other options. Some of them will crash the software. Some of them won't work very well. Just set it like this. Just set it to standard mode only. Go to lights, 
select maximum. There are various types of, of methods you can use here. And what, what you're doing here, and this is kind of important to understand, the software is not lightening the image. It's not taking photo after photo after photo and putting them on top of one another, making pixels brighter and brighter and brighter. <coughs> Instead, what's actually happening is it's getting rid of the noise in the image. And this right here refers to the method of getting rid of that noise. And there's all kinds of random methods you can use. Um, average works nicely, medium works okay, kappa sigma works good. But I would set it to maximum because that just does a really good job, I find, overall. Now, you can play with these over time. None of these are right or wrong. Some of them are better and, and less better for um, each uh, type of scenario that you're in. Select maximum. Now select for the rest of these, just keep them default, default, default. I'm just going to go through them so you can look at them. Default, 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 all default. I'm not going through all the details. I want you to understand how to use the software to make it basically work and you can play with it yourself afterwards. So what did we do? We, we used standard mode. We used maximum. I think when you start the program up normally it starts right here, but we're going to use maximum for calculating the, the stacking and everything else is going to be default. <coughs> Excuse me, click OK. Now to give you an idea quickly what we're doing, um, let's go back here for just a second. To give you an idea of what we're doing, imagine if these are pixels, okay? So right here is where photons from a star hit the pixels. These two pixels should be blue because this should be like a, a this should be like a star. But instead, because clouds and because of problems with the equipment and all kinds of stuff, some of this information got spread out. And if you saw in some of those pictures, you would sometimes see little fuzzy halos around stars and things that shouldn't be there. So how do we get rid of all this stuff? Well, a lot of people think that you stack photo on top of photo on top of photo, brightening them up. But all you do if in the end of that, watch this, is you just increase everything. You're just increasing it. So the noise that you had, this noise, continues to increase. See, there's the original, there's the increase. There's the original, there's the increase. You're just brightening up the noise that already exists. That doesn't make it any better. That's dumping garbage on top of garbage. What you need to do is figure out a way to say that these are the right pixels and these are the wrong, but how do you do that? Well, you draw a line in the sand and you say this far and no further. So basically put, we put a threshold out and we say, look, anything above this threshold this is probably the stuff that's really valid data. Stuff below the threshold is probably not valid data. That means, means that this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, and the one over here are not valid. So we can cut them out, leaving only the good data. So what did we end up with? Using this, this kind of method, and by the way, this is a gross simplification because we use a lot of statistical stuff um, when calculating this. If any of you watch my gamma spectroscopy videos, you know that I usually get more deep into the statistics of how this works. Um, with gamma spectroscopy, in some ways you're doing similar things for like you, when you're calculating like full width at half maximum and stuff for, for gamma spectroscopy, very important. So the same idea, basically put what you're doing is it, with star stacking is you're getting rid of noise, you're getting rid of distortion, you're getting rid of fuzz, you're getting rid of all that. You're getting rid of all the stuff that shouldn't be there. You're not making the image brighter. That's a confusing thing a lot of people have. You don't make the image brighter. So... Um, to give you an idea of why that's interesting and why that can be important, um, let's look at, uh, let's see, how about, how about this? All right, so here's a raw image. Do you notice when you look at the raw image, if you look really closely, you'll see there's a galaxy right here. Now, some people would say you need to brighten that galaxy up, make it stick out. Well, brightening it up will also brighten up all this other garbage around it at the same rate, and it'll still be just as hard to see. What you need to do is get rid of all this fuzz that isn't important. See the stuff that isn't a star? It needs to go away. Once it's gone away and then you do a little bit of uh, post-processing, you can end up with something like this. That's a little bit easier to see. It's still not a good photo because it was really, really hard to see. But you can now see the galaxy a lot better. Does that make sense? So raw photos turn into good photos. So now that we have a slight understanding of how that works, let's go over to the stacker, and we can begin working on it. Go. Stack, stack, stack. Now it's going to begin stacking. This takes a while. The result when we're done 
is going to be a window that is going to show the image right here and it's going to be all grayed out looking it's going to look terrible and you're going to be like oh my god i've done such a terrible job it looks so horrible what have i done wrong but the reality of the situation is it's going to look perfectly fine what you'll need to do at that point is close deep sky stacker and don't use it it's going to have all these tools that suggest that you could do all these nice nifty color manipulation things and stuff inside the software but you don't want to do that the reason you don't want to do it is because the um, steep size stacker is not really good for that. You want something like uh, Photoshop or GIMP. GIMP is free from the GNU software, guys. It's free, and we're going to use that now to stack the final image and see what it looks like. Alrighty. So let's go ahead and stack this thing. I'll do a um, time lapse and show you how it looks. All right, so here's the window I was talking about. And as you can see, there's the photo. It looks all black and white and terrible and stuff and doesn't look good at all. And there's all this stuff here which suggests to you that you could do amazing things with the software. Don't, don't do any of it at all. See this, the path to where the file is? It's in the same path where you did the original photos. It'll appear right when, wherever you have the light frames, that's where the photo is going to appear. And it's going to be called autosave.tiff grab that file because that's what you're going to use kill this program I'm actually on another computer let me get off and here it is this is the the, the the picture it already looks better just looking at it in like Windows preview so this is the photo we're going to use let's let's put this now into free software we're going to use the uh, GIMP uh, GNU image manipulation program GIMP um, it's free, and the reason I'm using free is because not everybody has expensive to, um, or not everybody has access to expensive software. And I hate when people <clears throat> do to, to, do tutorials using only the expensive stuff, and they say, "Oh, well, there's free stuff available, but I'm not going to show it because everybody has millions of dollars to spend." So I'm not going to do that. So we're going to drop this some um, uh, autosave.tiff that we got out of the st stacker into XN Convert, another piece of free software. Free software. Go to the out go output and set this thing to PSD, so Adobe Photoshop file, convert, <clears throat> excuse me, cough, cough, cough. I ate a hot taco, like a spicy taco in between doing this, and now I am coughing a lot. So close that, and now here's the result, saved in the same directory where everything was. So let's drag this into Photoshop, Photoshop. Now, we are Photoshop, huh? GIMP, see now I'm doing it. So there's a, a GIMP. So let's go to Windows, Layers. That This is in the uh, recently used toolbox stuff. So let's go up here to Dockable, Dialogs, and you'd find Layers right here. And then we can go to Toolbox. So now we have all the things that we need in GIMP. So I'm just going to show you how to do this pretty simply. The, for starters, let's go to Image, Transform, and Rotate this. <clears throat> the reason we're rotating is because it's you know flipped the wrong direction. Now it's flipped better to look nicer. Let's zoom in a little. Uh, yeah, that's not bad. Maybe a little bit more. Zoom, zoom, zoom. So there, we have Sirius right down the middle. The star Sirius. And look at this. That looks like M47, a small little globular cluster. A globular cluster. <clears throat> so let's do some stuff to make this image look better. I'd like you to notice that it already looks a lot better than it looked when it was saved in the TIFF format. Um, I think if the PSD file looks better. So let's go to... Um, Let's see what we notice that's wrong with the image. Do we see any, <clears throat> any trails that we need to get rid of? Airplane trails? No. <clears throat> Excuse me, everything looks pretty good. Now you're going to notice one thing that's annoying. Let me zoom in a lot. There's a whole bunch of zoom in. There it is. Do you see this? We'll zoom in just a little bit more. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm coughing every five seconds. I apologize. This is the result of the taco tacos but you know tacos are too important not to eat and if you don't like tacos I I can't help you see this this is called chromatic aberration the colors did not all focus in exactly the same point 
close, but not all the way. The slight differences aren't normally a big deal, but they bl the, they bleed a little bit outside of the main pixels where they're supposed to be. Remember I told you about how the pixels do the bleeding thing? And so <clears throat> you end up with this ring, this halo of blue around the star. Now we want to do something about that because we don't like this halo, but we'll do that in a minute. So first up on the, on the list, let's go to colors and let's go down to levels levels now what levels will do is it will let us clean up this background and make it a little bit darker we can now you have three adjustments you have this one you have this one and you have this one without going into a massive explanation of what they do quite frankly I would recommend that you play with them a little bit notice as you go this way the image gets darker but you lose some of the neat effects that you liked let's go back a little Moving this one lightens everything up, but we don't necessarily want to do that. And then moving this one kind of squeezes everything up. So what I'd recommend is doing that, doing like that. There, that looks kind of nice. And what does M47 look like? You can see M47 a little better now. All right, <clears throat> so now we're looking a little nicer. Next thing on the list, let's go to curves, color curves. And again, you have multiple directions that you can move this little dot around that produce various things. Some of them are horrible, like this. Some of them are horrible this way. So what we want to do, let's go back, is we want to adjust a little bit like this. Maybe just a little bit. And what we're doing is we're adjusting it until it looks good. You see I'm moving the black dot that way, slightly to the right. There, that looks nice. So we're darkening up the image a little. And the reason we're darkening the image is because we're going to brighten the image up afterwards and we don't want to cause a fuss. So the next thing on the list is um, we want to brighten up this star and fix a few of the problems. We want to make that chromatic aberration go away. So how do we do that? Well, we go over to layers. This is the main layer of the um, picture. Let's change its name. Uh, main. So that's the main layer. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make this look better now. We get rid of the chromatic aberration, fix everything up. So to do that, we're going to right click on the on the main layer that we have here, and we're going to duplicate that layer. We now have a copy, and we're going to call this um, blur. I'm just naming it that. Let me call it blur. Just giving it a name. Here's what we're going to do. These are duplicate layers now. They do the exact same thing. If I show it, don't show it. They look exactly the same. Select that blur layer. Go over to colors and go down to Posterize. Posterize tool, reduce to a limited set of colors. Boink. Let's click it. Now, the reason we're doing this is the number of colors we use is because, here we go, we'll go down to two, the limited number. That way the, black, the background actually becomes completely black. So now this background is completely black and all the stars are only white or black pretty much and, and there's like this little blue color. So there's the original, there's that. Now you're like, why on earth would you do that, Tom? It looks stupid. Because now we can go up to Gaussian, Blur. So Filters, Blur, Blur, Gaussian Blur, Gaussian Blur. Let's adjust ourselves so we're looking right at it. And let's expand this out a little bit. It's a nice, nice, nice blur. Okay. And we'll crank that number up. So if, here's the deal. If the number is really, really low, there's no blur. As you increase the number, the blur gets more and more and more and more. So we're going to set it up to like 36. That should be good. Just a random number. Click OK. And we blur it. Boink. Now we have, blur. Now we have a blur. Now we, what we do is we click the mode. This is the mode by which the layers are upon one another. And we set that mode to addition. Now, why? What, what did we just do? Well, let's look at the original. Let's look at this one. Original, this one. The new one, as you can see, doesn't have that chromatic aberration around it anymore because we pretty much blurred over it. Now, you might say, but Tom, you have changed and photo photographically manipulated the picture. Well, yeah, but here's the thing. The chromatic aberration wasn't really there to begin with. It was in the photo, but it's not on the actual star. If you look up with your eyeball at the star, you don't see the chromatic aberration because it's an artifact of the camera. So I, in a way, I'm sort of getting rid of the artifact of the uh, camera. And you can look at that multiple ways, and some people will be like, oh my god, that's terrible, how come, how could you have done that? You have 
destroyed the original intent of the photograph. But the reality of the situation is it looks nice. So the next thing we can do is go to main. This is the, 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 the layer below, the original layer. We can go up to colors, hue and saturation. So that was colors, hue and saturation. We're going to change the overlap to maximum. So we're going to be really, really, really just relaxed about how accurate we want to be about the colors here. We'll select yellow because a lot of stars are yellow. Crank that saturation up. Some of these yellow stars will stand out a little more. We want to go to blue stars. Crank that saturation up. Teal stars. Crank that saturation up, teal stars. <laughs> Some stars look a little teal. Red. There are red stars. And we want to crank them up too. There should not be any green in this photograph, so let's get rid of green. All right, now purple's an interesting one. You'll find lots of little chromatic aberrations. Some of these stars will look green, or sorry, look uh, uh, teal. Do you remember when I showed you the chromatic aberration? How it was green? How it was a um, how it, how it was a a purple color? I keep saying the wrong color. Well, we want to find any any of the other ones that are like that because that's not a natural star color. That's caused by stars that are blue that aren't showing up right. And we're going to adjust that so it looks bluish. Maybe it's a little tiny bit like that. There we go. So any stars that are in the background that are those colors will now look more correct. We're putting them to the color they're really supposed to be. All right. Here's the original. I think I overdid the blue a little bit. So let's go back for a second, and let's let's do those colors one more time. I think I overdid it. I should have been looking at this color. Go back to overlap. Uh, what I did was I think I did this, and that must have harmed it. Oops, I'm on the blur. Colors, hue and saturation, blue, overlap. So we're just doing what I did a minute ago. Yeah, there we go. That's where I screwed up. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to probably do this either. Yeah, maybe a little bit's okay. I want to get rid of green, like I said, there should be no green. Yellow I want to increase, like I said, there should be yellow. T, uh, why do I keep calling this teal? Something wrong with my brain? Um, that's like a, um, a um, um, oh, what is it, magenta. I have no idea why I'm having troubles with that today. So we'll set that to a nice blue color. Notice, by the way, that got rid of the chromatic aberration. That's an alternate method you can use if you don't want to do my other method. Increase that a little bit. All right. And now add the blur back, and everything looks nice. So let's now adjust a couple more things. Let's merge these two layers together. Now they are one. Now there's one thing you could do if you wanted to. At this point, you could duplicate the main layer if it wasn't bright enough. And you use an apply and sorry in addition to add it back. If you do this, everything gets really, really, really bright. Now that can look cool, but at the same time, did you notice how lots of entropy appeared? Go away. A lot of entropy appeared inside the picture when I did that. See, first picture, second picture. So it depends on how much of that you want. I wouldn't recommend doing it. I would not recommend doing it at all. I will leave it like it is. I think we have a good photograph now. And you see that you can um, see the, 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 the cluster right over here perfectly fine. Everything looks nice. <clears throat> As one side note, if you use filters, enhance, unsharpen and mask, unsharpen and mask, you can bring out things like, for example, clusters. So there's the cluster. So that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like after you bring it out a little bit. You can increase and play with these values if you want, but don't go too far with them. Now that cluster, as soon as this green gets over, that cluster right there is going to come stepping right out at us. Come on. There we go. The stars all came out a little better, didn't they? So I hereby call this photo pretty much done. You can play with it and toy with it some more. But it's a good star photo, all right? And we got this, if you recall, from images that looked like this originally. Let's flip it so it looks the same. That, that, 
that, that, that, that. And when I go really, really hardcore with it, I, I can make it look like this. And that's me using the blur at a much higher level and using a, a, a lot more, um, a, 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 like adding more layers on top and then merging them down with additional, uh, being in the mode of addition. That causes this uh, reddish to appear, unfortunately. This is from uh, uh, background light pollution. But it still looks pretty good. And so that's why this is beneficial to use um, stacking software. You can also do things like stack clusters. Like that. And then bring them right out of the sky where they were hiding once before. So hopefully this has been of use to you. Hopefully you have discovered this to be useful. Um, the basic understanding of how to use the stacking software and the fact that the stacking software does not brighten images. It instead reduces noise, which is something people don't quite sometimes understand. And how you can use up the Deep Sky Stacker to do it for you really easily and how to set your camera up. Um, if this is not good enough, if you find that you have some additional questions or want me to go into more detail about something, let me know and I will do so and show you even more details about how to use the software in more detail if you like. And um, there you go. So this has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Hopefully this was of help to you.